Alright guys, so now let's talk about naming epoxides. So, it turns out that epoxides are just cyclic ethers. That's basically the definition. And some types of cyclic ethers, remember that an ether is ROR, um, are going to be named as their own functional group due to increased reactivity. Okay, And the specific ones that we usually name as their own functional group are three-membered ethers. Okay because there happens to be a lot of strain in those rings, they're out of their normal bonding preferences, so or their normal angle preferences. So what that means is that they're very reactive and it's very easy to open them up. And what we call these three-membered cyclic ethers is, two, there's actually two common names for them. We call them epoxides, so go ahead and write that down, okay? They're also called, in some textbooks, some professors like to use the word oxirane. Okay, oxirane. These are really synonyms for each other, okay? An epoxide and an oxirane are the same exact thing, it's just a three membered cyclic ether. Cool so far, right? Now, the challenge becomes how do we name these guys? Because sometimes, first of all, they're not always three membered rings, and second of all, there's a lot of substituents. So it turns out that there's three different common ways to name epoxides, and I'm going to go over all of them right now. Let's start off with what we call the cycloalkane convention, okay? In this type of naming system, what we do is we name the entire ring as if it was an alkane first, okay? So, as you can see here, I have a six-membered ring, okay? But how many of those atoms are actually carbons? Only five of them are. I've got one, two, three, four, Five. Now you might be wondering why I started the one there. I didn't need to. I'm just using that. I'm, I'm, I mean, maybe I did, but I'm just using that as an example right now, just to count carbons, okay? So I have five carbons, but what I'm telling you is that we should actually name it as a cycloalkane, not by the number of carbons. So what that means is that usually when we're naming an alkane, we would say there's five carbons, so this would be cyclopentane, but it's not. We're going to call this actually cyclohexane because we go by the shape. Okay, what we're worried about here is the shape of the molecule, not how many carbons it has in it. Okay, so this would be a cyclohexane first of all as our root. Okay, now the difference is if we have oxygens inside of a ring, which is by definition a cyclic ether, right? Then we're going to add the prefix oxa. Okay, and what oxa is going to tell us is that there is one member of this ring that is an oxygen. Okay, so if I call it oxacyclohexane, what I'm saying is that I have a six-membered ring where one of the atoms is an oxygen, not a carbon, okay? And then obviously location if necessary. So let's go ahead and just talk about this for a second. The root is going to be the oxacyclohexane. I have that written here. Now we just have to talk about locations. How do we know where to put those guys? Well, it turns out that the oxygen is always going to get your one spot. So when I put the one here, that didn't really count. That wasn't true numbering. The way that I should really number it is starting from the oxygen because that's the highest priority atom inside the ring. And then obviously I should number to give you know the lowest overall number or to go to the next highest priority, etc. Okay? So this would be 3 methyl 1 oxacyclohexane. Cool so far? Just so you guys know, this also applies to rings that have more than one oxygen. If I had two oxygens, that would be what was called a dioxa. Okay? Just putting that out there, you could use prefixes as well. Okay? So now let's go ahead and talk about another naming system. By the way, one word really quick. This is going to be commonly used for non-three-membered rings. So if not three-membered, as you can see I was dealing with a six-membered one here, this is usually the one we use. Okay? So if it's four membered, five membered, six membered, etc., you would use this naming system. Now, if it is a three membered ring, we could still use it, but this is not going to be the most common way to name it. Okay? If we are dealing with a three membered ring, there's much more common ways. One is the epoxy convention. So, what the epoxy convention basically says is this we have a substituent named an epoxy group, okay? And we're just going to name our longest carbon chain as normal and then label the three-membered ring as just a substituent coming off of that chain, okay? And obviously give it the lowest number. 
One other thing about this that's interesting is that you actually have to name the locations of both of the atoms that the three-membered ring is attached to. So as you can see here, um, my epoxide is going to get priority over the methyl, so I would choose this to be my first carbon over here. Okay, That means that my epoxy group is, or my epoxy substituent, is across the 2 and the 3. Therefore, I'm actually going to call this a 2, comma 3 dash epoxy substituent because I'm basically saying that I have a bond to O across those two carbons. Okay? Then the rest of it we're just going to name like always. So this would be 2, 3 epoxy, 5 methyl hexane. Not so bad, right? Okay? So it's just something to consider that you could also use the epoxy convention. It's perfectly legit. Now there's, in t on top of that, there's even one more way to name epoxides. And that, this one actually comes from even further back in the history. Um, this one is actually like a reaction, okay? What they're basically saying is name it as an alkene. So pretend that the epoxy wasn't even there. Replace it with an alkene, okay? Name it as the alkene, the entire name. And then at the end, just add the word oxide, okay? Now, how does that make sense? The reason that makes sense is because... What we're saying is that we, we're we basically assuming that we start off with a double bond and then we did an epoxidation to put an epoxide group on that double bond. Now, you might not know how to do that yet, and that's fine. We're going to actually learn that pretty soon. Um, but I'm just saying that this is almost coming from the reactivity side of things, saying, well, I could start from a double bond, and if I do an epoxidation, I could get an epoxide, so then I would call it an oxide of that double bond. Okay, So in this case... I would call this, um, this would be hexene, right? Because I've got a six-membered um, chain. Notice that my double bond would be across the two and the three, but the way that I name double bonds is different from the way that I name epoxides. I actually don't say that this is a two, three alkene. I would just start where at the lowest number. So in this case, this is actually going to be what we call a two hexene. So don't get them, them confused. This would never be called a 2,3 hexane. You only do that for the epoxy substituent, okay? So we know we have a 2 hexane. Now we need a substituent, the 5-methyl, right? On the 5, so this would be 5-methyl 2-hexane oxide, all right? Now, just so you know, if your professor requires stereochemistry, if your professor is asking about stereochemistry, remember that's just like cis and trans and stuff, um, then you would have to provide it here, okay? So what that means is that notice that... I'm just going to erase some of this stuff really quick. Notice that these groups um, don't have stereochemistry. I don't have stereochemistry here. But if I had included, let's say, that this was to facing towards the front and this was facing towards the back, let's say, okay? Then that would actually show me the stereochemistry, whether these groups are cis or trans to each other. If they're trans on the epoxide, that means that they were originally trans. So then this would become trans 5-methyl 2-hexane oxide. Okay? Same goes with the epoxy nomenclature. It also counts. Okay? Notice that once again we didn't include stereochemistry. There was no wedge and dash. But if there was one, then you'd be responsible for that. Okay? So it was kind of a mouthful. Lots to remember there. Let's do some practice problems and see if we can get more comfortable naming epoxides.